Let's talk business models. Wait, 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 don't go. I know that you want to focus on the art of video games, but you still gotta pay the bills. So it's useful to think about how your game is going to pay those bills. And thinking about this early in your development allows you to make better choices and make a better game. I'm going to go over several different business models, some of which are in active use, some of which I've never seen, some of which have fallen out of favor. There are games in the marketplace today that combine these different business models in different combinations, and some games evolve over their lifespan from one kind of business model into another. But as we'll discuss, that's actually more difficult than you might think. As we go, I will also mention some of the KPIs or key performance indicators that might be used to measure the health of a particular business model and that you might want to consider if you're using it yourself. This list is far from comprehensive. I haven't ever worked on games with some of these business models. So in those cases, I'm speculating a little bit on the KPIs being used. If you are considering a specific business model for your game, I would definitely recommend doing Doing additional research to find best practices before moving forward. But I think this is a good introduction for the different business models that are out there right now and maybe some of these you've never heard of before. Let me start by just laying out one KPI that I think is critically important to all business models regardless of the exact specifics of that model and that is some sort of measurement of retention. By retention I mean how often, how many times, how many different days or sessions does somebody play Play your game. And why does this matter for all business models? Well, let's sort of think about it. If I'm trying to sell you boosters, the more times you play the game, the more opportunities I have to sell you that booster. But even if I only sold you the game up front and I'm never making money off of you again, at least until a sequel, retention is still really important because the longer I play the game, the more likely I am to mention how much I'm enjoying it to my friends and potentially generate a second sale that way. The longer I play a game, the more likely I am to have good memories of it and then buy the sequel. The longer I play the game, the more likely I am to buy DLC, the more likely I am to stay in a subscription. In all business models, making a game that keeps people engaged with it over a long period of time leads to a game that is better at making money, regardless on the specifics of how you're making money. I realize this is in a way kind of self-evident, make a good game that people actually want to play and you'll make money, but there can be subtlety to it. Now, it's interesting because the specifics of the kind of retention you want might be slightly different depending on your business model. Some games, like a single player premium game, having someone sit down and play it over two or three weeks is pretty good. It's a That's a great thing for them to do. They're playing it a few hours a day. That's great engagement. But for other games, free to play games, you might only want five or 10 minutes of engagement every day, but you want that engagement to go on for weeks or months or even years because you're building an, a habit in their lives where you can make a little bit of money every day over an incredibly long engagement with them. Let's get started. The first business model to talk about is free. When I say free in this case, I mean purely free in that there is no way in which they are monetizing you as a player directly. So how do these games make money? Well, it's possible that they have funding from somewhere else. Maybe they were built for research purposes, but chances are, as you've probably heard in other places, if you're not paying for the product, then the product is you. So chances are, if you're playing a free game, they're using you as a product. Maybe they're gathering data on you and selling that data off. Maybe they're using this as a loss leader for some other purpose, but chances are you are the actual product that this game is interested in. This is true even for some of the other free to play games we're about to get to. If you are playing those games and you are not engaging with the monetization program that exists there, chances are that game is treating you as part of the product. If you're playing Hearthstone and you're not buying their battle pass or buying their card packs, then your purpose is to provide other players against which people who are paying can play against. 
so you are part of the product. So what are some KPIs for a game like that? Well, probably the most important would be just a raw DAU or daily active user count because the larger the number of people you have, the more data you're gathering, the better that you're going to be able to monetize that data. A second one would be some measurement on opt-in or opt-out on telemetry. Because again, the more data you're able to gather on a person, the more valuable that data is going to be. This is very much the model that platforms like Facebook and Twitter have kind of ended up with. They do also run ads, but a lot of their money comes from being able to monetize the data they have on you. I don't think you see this very commonly in games in large part because the volumes are simply not high enough. The DAU on something like Facebook or Twitter is many times that of what most games see. Staying within free, the second kind of monetization would be ad-driven free games. This, I'm specifically referring to games where they play an ad between or before each instance of the game. So here, it's about getting as many ads as possible in front of people without becoming so obstructive and so annoying that people churn out of the game. So here again, you're going to care about DAU. This is very much a volume-based game. The amount of money you're making per ad is tiny. So it's about large numbers of players. The other thing you're going to want to know for a game like this is going to be RPM or how much money you make per thousand views or services of an ad. With this kind of monetization, it's potentially worth considering an upsell to an ad free version of your game because you make so little money per ad. That being said, once you've made that sale, then that player no longer monetizes because beyond that initial purchase price. So it is possible that even though you got two or five dollars from someone to remove ads, that if your game is engaging with them long enough, it's possible you might have made more by keeping the ads in front of them, though pretty unlikely. Third kind of free game is the MTX driven game. So here you can play the game for free, but there's some way that they are monetizing after the fact by selling you small amounts of something. This could be a game which is pay to win. This is very common in the mobile space where the game is free to play and it's possible theoretically to beat anything, but it gets hard relatively quickly. And then the goal is to get you interested enough in winning that you're willing to spend money in order to make it through a level or get good enough to beat other players. Pay to win is often obfuscated in some manner rather than just selling you a better gun they might sell you a pack that contains boosts that you can then apply to your gun to make the gun better. Or you might get packs where you collect different heroes and then you can combine the heroes to have a chance to make better heroes. And then you combine those better heroes to make even better heroes. The goal is often to hide the fact that you're paying directly for power by making it slightly more indirect so that there isn't that direct money equals power, but it's still there. The other kind of MTX is driven around vanity items. These are things that change the way that you look or give you some other mostly cosmetic impact. Interestingly enough, pay to win games, that can work both in mostly single player games as well as mostly multiplayer games. Competitive games against other people obviously give a good incentive to want to be better and to potentially pay money to be better, but it also can introduce this feeling of unfairness. So sometimes pay to win competitive games can actually have a very high churn rate because people feel like they're losing to people not that are better at the game, but they just have deeper pockets. On the other hand, in a single player game, you can feel like, oh, I just need to spend a few cents to get past this boss. Vanity game driven games where the MTX is mostly driven through vanity are, is different because unless you have a forum in which to show off your cool new look, most people aren't that driven by vanity. Some people are, and it can work in single player games, but a large percentage of your audience isn't going to be as interested in that vanity unless there's a place to show it off. One of the reasons I think that the vanity driven MTX is considered more acceptable in mainstream gaming is because there's a large number or large percentage of the gaming audience that aren't that interested in 
vanity. But it basically is hitting the same motivations that drive to be better or different from other people. MTX driven games sometimes have ads, but I don't consider them an ad driven game for this reason, because they're actually driving the ads off of triggering MTX. So you might watch an ad to get a power up or watch an ad to get a small amount of the in-game currency. So ads are layered on top of the business model as a supplementary way to engage in that that business model. For MTX driven games, you're going to care about DAU still because the more people you have playing your game, the better. You want to care about the percentage of people who play who convert into payers. This is both on an absolute percentage, but also on a daily basis. And then the two things you hear a lot about in the free to play marketplace are ARPU, which is average revenue per user, and RPPU, which is average revenue per paying user. You sometimes also hear RPPU called ARPS, average revenue per spender. I like RPPU better because you get to say PPU, which is more funny, and it will remain funny forever, but it, you might also hear ARPS. Regardless of whether the model is paid to win or vanity driven, MTX driven games can fall into really two different categories. They can have a bounded amount of spend, that is a maximum amount you can spend to acquire everything that there is to purchase, or they can have an unbounded spend or effectively unbounded. So if the game is bounded, that means there's somewhere less than say $300 worth of things that can be purchased. And then once you've spent that money, there's not really any more money to be spent spent. In this case, you need to have a relatively large number of people who are spending because once you've spent $300, you've spent all you can spend and you can no longer spend money in the game or new content needs to be added or the like. On the other hand, games that are unbounded or effectively unbounded, they may have no maximum on how much can be spent. This is where you get stories about people spending thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars on a game. These games often have random drop mechanics, loot crates, or card packs, and they sometimes have items that expire or wear out because the goal is to drive no limit to the amount that you can spend. Unbounded games are where you can get into kind of iffy territory. This is where you hear stories about dentists in Des Moines who spent $100,000 buying packs because they are trying to be the best or acquire everything and it's in this is where games can start to tap into some of the darker parts of people's psyches free-to-play games aren't inherently bad in their monetization model but it is a thing to be careful about because you can get into a kind of gray or even black morality with some of these games that are tuned to exploit people's weaknesses. Personally, I am very leery about unbounded mechanics because you end up leaning into your high spenders, your as they're called whales. They end up making up a large percentage of your revenue and that can cause you to do things that may not be the best. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about one last thing before we moved off of free-to-play games. And that is a relatively new thing that you're seeing, which is battle passes. Battle passes are something where you purchase a pass that then gives you access to a loot track that you unlock as you do things within the game. You earn experience or points or something that unlocks your way down the track. And then along that track, you unlock other things, basically the equivalent of MTX items. Battle passes are interesting because the way they're set up is they're usually shown as a dual track. The bottom is the track you're in if you're not spending any money, but you're still getting something. You're seeing yourself move along this track. And then as you go, you can see the things that you're missing because as you go, you get to level four on the track and you unlock a piece of MTX. And then maybe you don't unlock anything on the free track track until level eight. But on the other track, you unlock something at every single level. So it is this constant reminder as you play the game that you could be getting more if you were just willing to spend a little bit of money. I think I'm a fan of battle passes as a form of monetization in the MTX arena. The reason being is that I think they're pretty strong in encouraging monetization because of that constant reminder. And I think anything 
that encourages a greater number of people to monetize to a lesser degree is better ultimately for the health of your game ecosystem. So battle passes are usually pretty bounded. You pay a fixed amount and then you unlock your way down the track by playing the game. And usually you can't accelerate your way down that track by spending more money. So it's a very bounded spend, which I like. And because it's a, got a strong incentive there, I would expect that it would actually monetize, attach at a relatively high rate, which would mean that it is a potential replacement for those more unbounded spends that you see in some games. Moving into the premium space, traditionally premium games, there was only one business model. This was the business model of the first several generations of console games, and it was the PC marketplace for quite a long time as well. You sell a game to a person and that's it. You might try to sell them another game or something like a big expansion pack on a relatively quick cadence, but the model is sell them a game and then that's it, that's the money. So here the, the uh, KPIs are pretty simple. You care about how many units you sell and you care about the ASP, the average sale price. And the higher those are, the more money you make. For quite a long time, games have been about $60 US. They're about to go up to $70 US for most publishers. I just did a video explaining where that $70 goes and the breakdown of that money over the different parts of game development. I'll link to it above. But you haven't seen a large number of premium games at different price points. And why is that? Well, the reason is surprising a little bit because what you see is every once in a while, a publisher will experiment with different price points. They might release a game at $40. And what ends up happening is the price sensitivity is actually almost inverted for video games. Rather than people perceiving a $40 game as being a bargain, they perceive a $40 game as being somehow of lower quality. So games that are priced from the get-go at a lower starting point tend to sell less copies. And so you're selling less copies at a lower price. So it's a double whammy. You're getting hit twice on your revenue there. When we look at other entertainment medium, we actually see similar things. You don't see first run movies at different price points in the same theater. You do actually have some price differentiation in books, you have paperbacks versus hardbacks, and you have photo books at a higher price point than novels, for example. So it is possible in entertainment to have price differentiation, but we don't really see it right now in games. Does that mean that it's impossible for us to see this stratification or diversification within pricing? I hope not. I do think it's possible, but I think it would take a concerted effort by one or more publishers to really carve out that space and make it understood that this kind of game or this kind of price point is a quality game of either a slightly lower fidelity or of a slightly smaller size or scale. That hasn't really happened, but you have seen some mid-priced games be successful, so I do believe it's possible for us to see this in the future. Something that you used to see a lot more of, and is sort of similar to what Assassin's Creed has done, is the high frequency premium title. So here, your business model is based around making most of your money through this premium business model, but then you're iterating and releasing games at a very high cadence, with something like an Assassin's Creed as often as maybe every year. This can make a lot of money and it also gives you an opportunity to iterate on your game quite quickly and make changes and improvements quite quickly but it also can lead to burnout. You can see a couple of places where Assassin's Creed stumbled and ran into trouble because they were going too fast and they slowed themselves down and, they, and they've really recaptured that game and made something really special in the last couple of years. What became common basically starting with Oblivion from Bethesda and proceeding up until even today is the premium game with DLC. When I talk about DLC here, I'm not talking about MTX, I'm talking about relatively self-contained larger pieces of DLC. This is a business model that Bioware really embraced in the late 2000s and 2010s. I like it quite a bit. So here you care about units and ASP as you do with a pure premium game, but you're also going to care about the DLC attach rate. The reason why this business model is attractive is because when you're making this DLC, you're making it at the peak of 
of your team's efficiency. So you have a team firing on all cylinders and they're able to make content relatively quickly and relatively cheaply because they know what they're doing. And they're working with a mature, complete, tool set and a mature, balanced, debugged game engine. But the reason why you've seen this model start to fall a little bit out of favor is that DLC attach percentage. What we were seeing starting to happen was that attach percentage was starting to fall off. People were moving on to other games more quickly and as a result, they were not attaching on that standalone, strong, story-driven DLC as much as they had in the past. The other issue is one of magnitude. If you have a $15 piece of DLC and it gets a 10% attach rate, well, that's only a 4% revenue compared to the revenue of your overall game. So you have to do quite a few of those to have something that is significantly impacting the overall revenue of the game. So not to say it's not good money, but the total volume of money is small compared to to the game itself. What that's led to is this new kind of business model, which is driven instead of around individual DLCs, it's driven around a premium price and then some sort of MTX service driven model. This ends up looking an awful lot like the free to play model I talked about before, except there's that initial purchase price up front. So it changes things quite a bit in reality because with a game like Clash of Clans, your funnel is huge. You have have a huge number of people coming in to play the game to try it and you may only be converting a tiny percentage of those people into people who are willing to spend money or even play the game more than a couple of days. With a premium game, because there's a large initial upfront cost, people are much more likely to convert into payers at much higher rates, like 10 times even more the rate because they've already spent 40, 50, 60, maybe even $70 just to play the game in the first place. You have a more distilled or focused player base from the get-go. This introduces those KPIs from the other models. So now you're caring about units, you're caring about ASP, caring about the conversion to payer percentage, you're caring about ARPU, and you're caring about RPPU. And then combining all of these models together, you get into something where it is a premium game with DLC and MTX. So here it's everything all at once. You care about units, you care about ASP, you care about your DLC attach percentage, you care about the pricing of the DLC, you care about your pay conversion, you care about your ARPU, and you care about your RPPU. In reality, what's going to likely happen is that one of the DLC or the MTX is going to drive the majority of monetization. That being said, the hope that you would have in attaching some form of service to your DLC-driven game would be more about retaining people playing the game as opposed to necessarily monetizing them off your MTX loop. If people are still playing the game two months later, they're much more willing, much more able to purchase your $15 piece of DLC. If on the other hand, they've moved on to something else, then you have to get them to come back. So in this model, retention becomes critically important because the longer people play, the more willing they are to buy more things. These two service based business models can be really attractive because not only can they make a lot of money, they actually make money over a potentially relatively long period of time and that money can be relatively consistent, which looks really good for a business. If it feels like a few years ago, all games were trying to be services, to some degree that's actually true, but here's a little secret. Lean in really close. I don't want anyone else to hear. Okay, ready? Not every game can be a service. Everything isn't a service. Everything can't be a service. And the effort of trying to make your game into a service, if you're forcing it, has a high probability of compromising your game and making your game worse. Going to MMOs and the like, you have the subscription model. Here, it's not really about DAU, it's about MAU or monthly active users, because you're getting people to pay you a certain amount of money every month for the privilege of playing your game. 
Interestingly, in some ways, your perfect player is the person who subscribes and then doesn't play it very much, in that they don't put that much load on your servers. However, if you have a lot of these people, then your servers are empty and you have a problem because the game feels dead, even though you might have large numbers of people paying you. You do want both highly active and slightly less active players in this business model. Another KPI you're going to care about is LTV or lifetime value. This is kind of wrapping up an idea of how long are people playing your game and paying you for the privilege. You do see some blending of subscription with free to play and free to try. In fact, most MMOs over their lifespan have tended to evolve from subscription driven to free to play models as their initial subscriber base has started to drift away. WoW hasn't exactly done this. They have a free to try model. You can play the initial levels for free, but then to move beyond a certain point, you have to pay for that right. But other games like SWOTOR or Elder Scrolls Online have a free to play model on top of a subscription model. Something we've seen relatively recently is the multi game sub. So this is the PSN network or Xbox Live or the origin subscription from EA. Here it's about getting people to stay inside that ecosystem. So individual games are monetizing often based upon the number of session days they're getting, but that's kind of flawed because it's relatively easy to game and it may not be exactly what you want or it's not the only thing that you want as the person running this subscription. If you look at something like Netflix, people might watch a ton of Friends, but it shows like Stranger Things or the like that actually cause this network effect which gets people to get the subscription and keep the subscription. You might be engaging day to day with something like Friends, but the thing that makes you talk about the experience, the thing that made you get it in the first place, might be something else. This is relatively new and I think the KPIs here are still evolving and settling, but I do think there is something to be thought of or considered when it comes to how is this causing network effect? How is this strengthening the hold of this subscription as a overall experience, not just how much are people playing this game. Maybe go and ask Netflix. I suspect they have an excellent KPI that revolves around network effect. One of the things that's so attractive about subscriptions is that the passive action of your player is to keep the subscription, which means if they do nothing, once you've gotten them into your ecosystem, they continue to give you money. And that is like dollar signs in your eyes. That being said, getting people to come into your ecosystem in the first place can be very difficult. A couple of final models, relatively dead now, but you have CoinOp. So CoinOp is the old arcade model. You come in, you put a quarter in, you play the game for a fixed period of time, and then maybe you have to put another quarter in, maybe you finish the game on a single quarter. This is interesting, and but largely you don't see it anymore outside of the remaining arcades that are out there, because in the free-to-play universe, this is probably most similar to to that ad-driven model where you watch an ad to play a game. But where in the coin-up world, you made a quarter for a person to play a game, now you're making a couple of cents at most for people to play a game by serving them the ad. So you're having to make it up in volume. I'm not really sure what KPIs were used for coin-up games. They might have something like network effect as well because the goal is to draw people into an arcade. I'm not sure. If you are familiar with these KPIs, please let me know down in the comments. Something else pretty new is the Kickstarter campaign and early access. In both of these cases, you are getting money selling the game before it's done. With a Kickstarter campaign, you are potentially selling something that hasn't even been started. With early access, you're selling a game that is in development. I don't know that these have any differences in KPIs to just a premium style game. They might. I haven't run a game development through either of them, but ultimately they look the most to me like the premium model.
And then a final business model that I've been thinking about that I haven't really seen outside of some things within the small MMO and small online game space is the idea of vanity games or vanity content. And what I mean by this is more about what you see with high rollers in Las Vegas. Maybe bespoke experience might be a better way to talk about this. Some MMOs that are very small or some online games that are very small, they do do their business differently than the large games do. Rather than trying to make money off of thousands or tens of thousands or millions of people, they're making their money off of a few people. And they know those people by name. And they do things specifically in their games to meet the needs of those very small number of people. I wonder if there's maybe an opportunity to do this on a broader scale. To maybe make entire games specialized or customized to specific specific people's wants and needs. I don't know, and I haven't really seen anything in this space as of yet, but it's interesting to think about. As I said, some games move through different versions of these business models over their lifespan, but it's important to note that that's not as easy as it sounds. If you are a game that is driven off being a premium standalone experience, then you're about delivering the most content concentrated experience possible over a length of time that feels appropriate for the price you're paying for the game, but not any longer than that. Dragging it out actually makes your game feel worse. To just convert that game to free to play, free to play is about getting people coming back again and again in order to make a few cents off of them each time they come back. So the pacing of those two games are very different and moving from one business model to another is a non trivial exercise that requires a lot of thinking and a lot of effort to make that transition. Okay, there they all are up on the screen all at once. I wasn't expecting this video to come in over half an hour long. I hope that it helped illuminate some of the different ways that video games can make money. I think I've got most of the currently in effect business models. If I didn't, let me know down in the comments. And if you have any ideas of other things that maybe game developers should be trying in order to pay for their development, add that in the comments as well. If you enjoyed this, give this video a like, share it with other people you think might find it useful. Thank you. I will see you again soon.